Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, hope you enjoyed your lunch. I'm going to be taking you through the technical changes. Um, there's quite a lot to go through. I've spent a little bit of time over the last few months writing the new training course, so um, this is kind of my first test of it, so hopefully it'll come over reasonably well, save you having to wade through the manual like I did, and pinpoint some of the key changes. Well, I want to begin by going back to what Scott said this morning about some of the underlying intentions behind what we need to do as an entire industry together, particularly create demonstrable value for the end user. <coughs> We're ultimately all working to create buildings that work, not just the day they are handed over, not just for the contractor who builds them, but for the occupants that are in them for the next 100 years, whatever it is. To, no to make that more provable, we need a massive increase of flow of information. So a lot of the things that you're feeding back to us about case studies, examples of real value that we can demonstrate before the construction or the, the outset of a building commences, we need to start really working on that. And that's something that's also being addressed in the new scheme. And we need to demonstrate that future value right now. Okay, and we're going to need to do it quickly. Okay. So hopefully I can pinpoint some of the ways that the scheme is hoping to address that. And it, it's just the beginning. The speed of change is going to get faster and faster and faster. We're going to have to do that. And Breen will do their best to keep pace with that. Okay. So I'm going to go through quite a lot of different bits of information. I'm going to be cherry picking the key bits. So I might not go through every single point in the slide. You guys know most of this stuff. I'll just be highlighting the stuff that's new. First thing to reiterate is that Bream 2011 is a consolidation. All the manuals are now into one um, easy to use manual and covers the majority of building types. Okay? Still, there's going to be a few bespoke assessments that are not covered and you can go down the standard bespoke route for that. But a lot of the old bespoke buildings will be included in there. 49 issues across nine categories, and the criteria still makes allowances and accounts for the differences in those different types of buildings, so the occupancy levels and usage differences. Okay, so it's still working in the way it was before. A few of the benefits, which hopefully I will go on to demonstrate, it's obviously an updated world-leading environmental performance standard for new buildings. New buildings. Um, it's got that robust yet flexible low-cost approach to setting, measuring, and monitoring building performance targets. So we don't always, we don't just want to aim to achieve those. We want to demonstrate that it's actually achieving that, because that's going to help um, raise the uptake in the long term. Obviously, it aligns with all the new regulations. New versions of BREAM always have to uh, keep pace with those standards and practices, and. It provides a structure that encourages and supports the defining of delivery of lo low carbon, zero carbon buildings, as you'd expect. Also facilitates the delivery of whole life building benefits. And this is something we're going to nearly really need to step up. So the design stage, construction stage, for no additional cost. We're in a situation economically in the world where there isn't pots and pots of extra money. So if somebody says to you, oh, I can do this, but it's going to cost you extra, they're probably going to say no. So we have to get good at demonstrating, well, actually, okay, there's going to be costs involved, but it's going to be lower costs because long-term, these are the impacts. And the evidence is there. We need to get more of it. We also need to benchmark, find out how our buildings are doing compared to everything else so people really know how they're performing. And if they're not performing well, they know they can do something about that. Okay? So that's the whole way that the scheme, and schemes such as Bream, can facilitate massive change. And... We are always trying to demont demonstrate real value to the end user. Okay? So I'm going to kick into... Uh, one thing I want to say before I go into this bit is just to reiterate what Tim said earlier about refurbishments. Okay? The new version of Bream 2011, because we're getting a separate Bream refurbishment scheme, isn't, hasn't been designed to tailor to refurbishments. So Bream 2008 also wasn't brilliantly, I mean, it couldn't cover every single possible, especially small refurbishments, but it was more tailored to refurbishments than the new version will be. So you've got a choice. If you're doing a refurbishment, you can go back to Bream 2008 and use that, or you can use Bream 2011, or you can wait for the refurbishment scheme to come out um, early next year. Okay, so they're the choices. 
there are still minimum standards. Um, I'm not going to go through all these. There's a list in the manual that tells you what they are. Some of them refer to you need to get a certain number of credits. But also now there are some which only require certain criterion to be met. Okay, so you may say you've just got to do criteria one and then that will get you the minimum standard. So watch out for those. All right, so these are the issues I'm going to go through that are either completely new or partly new to you. Okay, so quite a lot in management and there's a good reason for that because a lot of what's in management is all about exactly what we're looking for from Bream Assessors. It's about getting in early. It's about making good decisions at the point where you can still make them and proving and demonstrating value long term and then delivering it. So anybody in here who's not clear that that's something that you can offer massive value to, I mean, that's something that you are doing. Okay, so um, between us we can really put that over. And hopefully, when I go through those, you'll see how we're trying to do that. Energy One, there's a shift in the way that's assessed, which makes a huge improvement in terms of what people should be doing. Okay? A lot of you guys know this already. You know what needs to be done first, what needs to be done second, what needs to be done third. But you don't necessarily get rewarded for it. Now you will. Transport, public uh, transport accessibility, a slight change in the methodology there. Similarly for water consumption and life cycle impact. So I'll, I'll mention those. Responsible sourcing, slight redefinition of the tiers, I'll explain all that fully. Um, mitigating ecological impact, slight redefining of some of the um, categories. So in terms of the, the little groups of um, def defining the, the, the land, so I'll explain. And oh, we always like to go to surface water runoff, so we'll spend a bit of time uh, going through that if you're not uh, fully conversed in that already. Okay, it wouldn't be on a Saturday without doing surface water. Okay, so I'm going to start off with management, and you've actually all got a copy of these summary slides somewhere in your pack, so if you wanted to refer to those as you go along, you're more than welcome to. There are five issues here, quite a lot of credits available, but the considerate constructors and the site impacts you know already, so we're not going to look at those. We're going to look at number one, four, and five. Okay, so again, I'm not going through every detail, but I'll give you the structure, give you the intent. Okay, so these eight credits are split between, for sustainable procurement, between project brief and design, construction and handover, and aftercare. All need to be addressed to get the best possible building, as you know. First credit in project brief and design is about getting key people involved. Again, there's nobody in this room who doesn't agree with that. You, if you're going to make good decisions, you've got to have people there who know what impacts they're going to have if you don't make the correct decisions, and have them involved, make sure the decisions are made correctly. So. You need to define the roles and responsibilities, make sure the key phases are being covered, and you're looking at the end user requirements, mm -hmm. the aims of the design, all the budget and expertise, the usability in the long term, to make sure that your plan has got a chance of working. You're not just thinking short term, OK, well, this is what the contractor wants, but what does the builder want, what does the occupant want? You're thinking about as much as you can, and that's all going to pay off long term. We, all know, we also know that to really nail that down, we need to make sure those messages get passed on. So training for the occupant or the building manager is one of the areas where we know we've fallen down in the past. Great building's been designed, the intent has not been met because people don't know what they're doing. So we've got to address that. Next three credits are awarded for having a BREAM AP. Okay, so let's clarify the difference between a BREAM assessor and a BREAM AP. The assessor is certified and trained to assess. Now, we all know that a lot of assessors do a lot more than that, and that's great. But they're not certified by BRE to do so. Now, I'm also not saying that BREAM APs are all singing and dancing and, and know everything, but they have had some additional training which particularly emphasises the importance of getting involved at the key stages and making things happen and ensuring that they do. Okay? And we've firmed up the criteria. We've given them an extra credit, but it's actually in terms of percentage terms, slightly lower because it's, this is weighted, it comes out to about 1.64%. But if you think that an AP is there to get 1.64% from this thing, we're missing the point of what an AP is there or any good consultant. You're there to get value throughout the entire BREAM scheme. So these are just an initial driver to get people involved. Um, you're going to get value everywhere. So in terms of the details, they need to be involved 
early on, no late in rate REBA stage C, set the targets, contractually plumb them in. You need to then do extensive monitoring during that key process so things don't get dropped to make sure that they are being maintained. You've got to report on that, attend the meetings, and an additional credit to get the third one to do that all the way up until the point of handover. Okay, so that should really add that level of quality to that and ensure, encourage people to do that. On to construction and handover, those two credits, looking for stuff that you, again, you know makes a difference. So if you don't do a thermographic survey, you don't know that your building is working, doesn't have loads of leaks in it. So we do that at that point. Um, there's various criteria there. I won't go through that in detail, but you can see what it says. Um, and then commissioning, you're all aware of because it's in the current scheme. So this is all about making sure that that next level of quality is maintained and we're not dropping threads um, after a very good start. Finally, we need to make sure that it's continued into the inception of the building. So when the occupants move in, is it still working as it was intended? So we do some seasonal commissioning to make sure that first year is going according to plan. And if you also look at the performance data, you'll get an additional credit. So we want to say, okay, right, well, you were expecting it to use this much energy. It's actually using this much energy. Well, can we do something about that? Is it meeting those targets? So we're really kind of testing the water there. And if you do that for three years, you'll get an exemplary credit. Okay? So we're trying to encourage a real thoroughness in that period of time which makes the biggest difference. And that's where the people in this room who, who can really advise and help people who don't necessarily have their fingertips on all of the key information, they don't know that you can save them thousands and thousands of pounds, but you can. So if you um, long-term plumb that in. Okay, so stakeholder participation. These four credits are available. The two in the middle you are already familiar with. Okay, so you know about inclusive and accessible design and the need for building user information. Um, the consultation and the post-occupancy evaluation are relatively new, so I'll talk a little bit about those. Consultation is about talking to the people who are going to be using the building. You've talked to the people who are going to be creating the building and got them working together, but this is about the end user. Okay, so using all the key people to really tune in with the end user's needs at this point. You've got to put in some time scales for that particular whole process to make sure that it's not just um, a lip service to that. There's some key things that need to be covered in terms of, of content. So that's all uh, outlined in the man manual. So particularly things like functionality, the management and the maintenance that can be big players if you get them wrong. We want to look at those at this stage. We also want to involve them in the feedback. So we don't just want to consult them once and then they never hear about it again. So to maintain that, that link is going to be uh, productive. And there's some other rules in terms of other buildings which I won't go into to here. Inclusive and accessible design, you're already familiar with, so it's about the accessibility, um, refers to the K publication there, which I think probably is new. And also it addresses the shared facilities. So if you've got a building that is going to be used by a broader number of people in the population, the community, then that's the place to consider that to make sure that's done correctly. Building user information is there, and you know that. That's already been in Bream for a long time. And the post-occupancy assessment is, again, it's tapping into this need to get this flow of information. So the building doesn't get completed, then we forget all about it. We find out whether it's working, and we can feed that back into the way we do things in the future. So one year after the building's uh, been occupied, independent third-party reviews, the design and construction process, feedback from the users, particular topics won't be covered there, and the sustainability performance. That also needs to be disseminated. Okay, so we're putting things in to encourage this flow of information. And the final one in management is life cycle costing and service life planning. And I'm sure there's nobody in here who doesn't agree that that's um, a huge area that's still in need of massive investment and development. I'm sure there's nobody in this room who hasn't been, well, what's the value of this? I want it in terms of finance. And we need to get a lot more information and proof that there is massive value long term. 
I think we'll all agree that it's there, but it's not there on a plate. So you're going to get rewarded up to a maximum of three credits, depending on the level of detail that you go to in your life cycle costing uh, approach. The first credit is about setting up the life cycle costing analysis, making sure that's carried out at the stages that is mentioned there. And there is some external guidelines to follow in terms of creating one that works. It is based on the 60-year period. I think that is the standard study period for a building. I know, obviously, not everybody uh, is in alignment with that one, but that is the one that's standard throughout the industry and has been for a long time. Um, and there's various other requirements that ensure that you actually get a result which will create some value and you can make good decisions on it. You need to also take into account the service life and the planning of that. So making sure that you're looking at the ongoing maintenance of that particular building. If in addition to that you go one step further and include elements of two or more of the following there, the envelope, services, finishes and external spaces in that life cycle costing, you'll get an additional credit and highlight the options to meet performance criteria and the lowest discounted life cycle cost model is chosen, which obviously still meets one of those four things. We want it to be the, not just the lowest cost one at any cost, but it wants it to be also delivering the value. So lower energy consumption, reduced maintenance, extended service lives and so on. Okay, so you've got to at least demonstrate um, the value there. And then if you go one step further than that, you update this model at stages D and E, and you demonstrate that those results of the study have been implemented, you get an additional credit, providing that also covers the maintenance strategy as defined there. Okay, so hopefully, obviously I haven't gone through every single detail, but hopefully you can see the intent of that and the value that would be gained from doing that. Now, that's not going to happen overnight, and, but with that information coming through and the way that we structured the reporting system now means that there's going to be a huge amount of information that we can then feed back to you about what's working and what's not working. And that's something that I think we all agree is, is a bit of a missing. Health and well-being, nothing's changed in health and well-being. What has changed is that it's been clustered into different groups. Okay? So it's a lot more consolidated. Uh, a lot of the individual issues are now lumped into one of these six categories. Um, one neat way of looking at it is it's quite closely linked to the senses. So you've got your vision, smell, touch, taste, ears, and general safety. So all of that is covered there in terms of the health and well-being of the building. Okay, so energy. There's only really two areas here that are new. I'm going to take you through. Everything else there you've seen before, so I'm not going to take you through those. But the two that we're going to focus on, obviously, Energy One and the energy efficient equipment. I'll obviously be focusing mostly on Energy One. So, the way this is improved is that it's more than ever before focusing on what really counts in terms of energy performance of buildings. The way we're doing that is by using something called the Energy Performance Ratio for New Construction, the EPR little NC. And it's got three parts, three parameters. So I'll talk about those three parts. I'll also talk about how it works. So it's essentially each part is going to be taken through a comparison with a notional building standard. It'll then get translated into a ratio based on where it sits in the whole spectrum of buildings. And also there'll be a weighting applied to bring the three together. So I'll hopefully identify what you need to look for, what's needed, and also how to assess it. It's relatively straightforward to assess, like most of the energy is. It's the thinking behind it that might be tricky, but the actual assessment of it is a matter of picking information out from the, the, uh, the outputs. So these are the three parameters. Demand, <coughs> consumption, and finally the CO2. I'm going to come back to these a few times, so that's just the first introduction. The three steps again. So you calculate the actual performance in each of those areas as a proportion of the notional. So you're seeing where it compares with a standard building. We then translate it into a ratio based on where that performance lies in the range of all buildings. So it's another calibration of is it any good or is it 
pool. You'll see how that works. And then we amalgamate them together into one single ratio out of one. Okay? Now, how it works is obviously a few calculations involved, but the practice of doing it is straightforward because the tool does all the working for you. It's helpful to understand the principles, but I'll take you through those now. So those are the three parameters, the demand, the consumption, and the CO2. I'll come back to that. So let's look at step one. So we've got our notional building over here, and let's allocate that a, an arbitrary score of 44.4. We give that the equivalent of 100%. If the actual building is 32, then we work out that that is 72% of 44.4, and that's how good it is compared to the notional. That value is 72% of the notional, so it's improved in that, in that much. Now, that, that doesn't indicate whether that's any good or not. I mean, every other building may have improved by, gone down to 60%, in which case it probably won't score very well. Similarly, it could be very good. Everybody else might have been only at 80%. So we need to find out a way of working out where it lies. That's what the next step's involved. So what this chart is showing you is where the range of stock appear. Now, we modelled um, a number of buildings initially. The beauty of the system is that we'll be able to add to that model and increase the effectiveness and accuracy of the, the benchmarking over time. Another thing that the new version of Bream is facilitating. But you can see there that the bell curve, it's a normal distribution, as you'd expect, and that's the range of complete scores, the best being the lowest, there's the average, there's the worst, and you need to find out where your building lies in that range. The blue line will tell you what the equivalent ratio will be for that particular score. So if your individual score is there, you simply read off what the EPR, in this case it will be 0.8. Okay? So that's the way it's going to be translated for each of those three parameters. And step three, so once you've done that for each of the three parameters, you've got a Point, a score between 0 and 1 for each of them. You then apply this weighting, and that will give you one single score. I'm going to come back to these weightings, because even though it looks like the CO2 emissions is the greatest weighting, which clearly is, mathematically it is, but given what you know about how buildings work, you've got to get the demand right before you get recognition for the energy consumption and the CO2 emissions. So actually the weighting is the other way around, even though mathematically it works out this way. And you'll see that if it's not obvious already. OK, so in summary, we've got this ratio. It's made up of those three things, the demand, the consumption, and emissions. Let's look a little bit closer at what each one of those is influenced by. Clearly, demand, you need to look at the, the fabric performance, the insulation quality, the air permeability, but also the design. So things like orientation, thermal mass, they're all going to make a difference to the demand. And a well-designed building will have a very low demand you're always going to start there. That's the first priority. Once you've done that, once you've done as far as you can in terms of minimizing the demand, you want to supply that um, amount of energy as efficiently as possible. So then you're looking at your services, the consumption. How effectively can you supply that consumption? So you need to look at the boiler type, the boiler efficiency, but also the way you distribute that heat or cool. That's the next priority. Both of those are going to influence the amount of CO2 that's going to come off that building. But the fuel that you use in whichever system you're using also is going to have a bearing, so that's also covered. In terms of the procedure, you can use the national calculation methodology, any approved software, this is all stuff that you know already, credit and energy assessor, and the outputs from that particular software will feed directly into the, um, the tool for energy. So the key bits of information you need to read off the demand, notional and actual, consumption, notional and actual, CO2 emissions, TER, BER, and the building floor area. It's pretty much all you need. Where do you get that from? There's the front page of the output document. So any approved building energy software will provide that one, SBEM or similar, all have this output, and you go to your energy assessor to get that. On page four, there's a box at the bottom there, and it looks like that. And Six pieces of the seven bits of information are in here. So you've got your actual and notional, demand, consumption, and CO2 emissions. OK. Have you spot the deliberate mistake on that one? 
hatch rules are both really integrated. I'll correct that at some point. Ignore the exemplary bit to begin with. Clearly, you're going to get the credits between 1 and 15, depending on what level of energy ratio you've got. So if you get as far as 0.9, you'll get the full 15 credits. So it's pretty much the same way of reading off as you're used to. The 1 to 5 exemplary credits are available for unregulated energy. So SBEM looks at regulated energy. Everything else is defined as unregulated. If you also supply all of that, so it's completely zero carbon or carbon negative building, you'll get the full five exemplary credits on top of that. If you don't quite get uh, all of it and you get a proportion of it, then you'll get between one and four. Now, I need to explain this next bit very carefully. In terms of working out how much unregulated energy you've got in a building, there is no simple algorithm for that. So what we're doing is we're using, as a proxy, the regulated energy demand consumption that you've got. You know that. It's not always going to be exactly what it would be for the regulated. It's not going to be a perfect proxy, but it's available and you can use that. So if you supply the equivalent of 80% of the regulated consumption for the unregulated demand, so it's going to actually provide that for the unregulated functions, then you will get four credits, three credits, two credits, one credits. Okay? So it's a little bit strange when you read it in the manual, but that's what it's doing. It's talking about addressing unregulated energy, but it's using regulated numbers to demonstrate how much of that you're doing. There are also some minimum standards. So if you're going for pass, excellent, outstanding, and 15 credits, there are requirements there for numbers of credits, but also an overall EPR, but also a minimum CO2 parameter. Okay? So um, I'll leave you to digest those at a later point, but all the information is in there, and they're the minimum standards. So they, they equate to what they were familiar before. So you've probably recognized those numbers in the final column. It's the same standards as existed before. Energy aid, energy efficient equipment, back to unregulated energy consumption. Um, so the assessment steps, you have to work out what unregulated energy you've got in your building. So there's no definitive list. There is a list. You need to look at what you've got in your building that's in that list. Identify which apply to your building and determine which make up the significant majority. And then you need to meet the compliance requirements for each one. So those are the list of categories. So if you've got any or all of those, you need to take account of that and come up with a plan to address the significant majority of that for your particular building. Now, there's no definitive calculation rule. You've got to work with the design team to justify their decision on what they consider to be the significant majority, and you have to concur with that. Okay? So that's the flexible approach to something which is quite nebulous. Uh, transport, again, very little has changed. I'm just going to tell you a little bit of the calculation methodology changes, tweaks in public transport and maximum car parking capacity. We're still using the accessibility index in public transport. It's still taking into account the distance, the public transport type, the frequency of services. Clearly, it's looking at lots of more building types, so that there's a number of credits variation between two and five, depending on what scenario you're in. But the one thing that we have done is we brought in flexibility in terms of how available the public transport is and the situation that you're in. So if you're in a rural situation, then you don't lose a lot of credits because there's not that many, as many credits allocated to it. Okay? So this table will tell you for each building type you've got how many credits are available and the corresponding accessibility index you need to achieve to get it. The ones in red are defined on the next slide. So things like higher education, there's a different number of credits available for places where students mainly commute, so you have to do a lot better on your transport for that one, get more credits, converses with the students who mainly live on site. Similarly for other buildings, if you've got staff only, it's different to if you've got staff and many visitors, more credits available, but less credits available if you're in a rural location. Okay, so hopefully that will alleviate some of the challenges we've had in the past with that. 
The other possibility is if you've got a dedicated bus service, and you're not getting credits using the accessibility index, you can still get a credit for having one of those. Maximum car parking capacity, again, is improved in its accuracy because it's taking into account the level of public transport. So you're using the value of accessibility index uh, derived in Transport 1 to help you determine what the number of car parking spaces should be. Okay? And it defines it in number of spaces per X number of users, so one space for every five users, for example. This is the table, so you find the building type. You then need to know what your accessibility index is. Find that in the range, so you can see the range is there. And then simply read off the, the maximum car parking capacity to get one or two credits. So office, accessibility index of five, middle column, one credit, you need one space for every four building users, but if you're going for two credits, you need one space for every five building users. Okay? So just take that into account and it'll give you the right requirements. Clearly, that doesn't work for everything, so in colleges, healthcare, certain scenarios, there'll be a different algorithm, but it'll tell you what it is. Okay? On to water. The only thing that's changed there is a bit about water consumption. Essentially, it's doing the same thing. I'll just say that. The tool will gather information and determine the improvement over a national baseline. The only difference is that it's doing it more on an element-by-element -element basis in terms of fitting. So you're comparing it with the national baseline, yes, and you're producing a percentage improvement over the, the norm. Okay? And depending on how much improvement there is, you'll get between one and five credits, possibly an exemplary. There is the standard approach. There's also an alternative elemental approach, which I'll come on to. But the standard approach is basically comparing that actual tap with a baseline or notional tap, and depending on how much better it is, will influence the number of credits available. Okay, you do that for each fitting, and it's building type, type specific. The alternative elemental approach is where there isn't data existing to be able to do that standard approach. So if you've got a particular type of building that we don't have data for or it's not appropriate to use that, then there's an alternative to, to use. This is just a small extract of the baseline data and the different requirements for each of the levels in the table. It's not all of it, but it gives you an indication of how it's laid out. And you use that for both approaches few new things on grey and rainwater systems. There are some British standards that you need to comply with on those, so watch out for those. There is also a requirement to have a minimum component efficiency before you get recognised for using grey or rainwater. That makes sense. You want to minimise the demand before you start offsetting with something from somewhere else. So, similarly to the Energy One principles. So, well, there's some details there. You have to get at least two credits in the component efficiency if you're going to go on to get four credits or more for having grey or rainwater. You can also use it to meet, obviously it needs to meet the standard components, the domestic energy consumption facilities, but if you've got something like an intrinsic building demand, like a laundry, you could also use it to offset there. And you can also get it from different possible sources of grey water as well. So there's fluctuations and alternatives there too. Just a little bit on the alternative elemental approach. So you use this if you cannot use the standard approach or it's not appropriate, there's no building patterns um, available or usage types, and the tool will take you through this. It does take into account the individual uh, fitting efficiency, but also the proportion that that individual fitting type makes up of that particular entire building's demand. So again, it's going to be as fair as possible allocating credits to the places where it's most important. On to materials, just a couple of things to cover here for life cycle impacts and responsible sourcing. The only thing that's changed in life cycle impacts, the principles are all the same, but you're getting additional recognition now for using environmental product declarations. Okay? So this is something that needs to be encouraged in the industry. They're very robust, they're a lot more accurate, um, and we want to encourage the flow of information. So higher, higher scores are possible for having specifications with those in them. So we want to encourage the suppliers to uh, be rewarded in terms of creating um, products with EPDs. And the points uplift available is based on 
the proportion that that particular material makes up of the entire specification, obviously, but also the existing green guide rating, and also the type of EPD. So the type is referring to how much of it's covering in terms of the process. If it's looking at partially or wholly life cycle assessing, then you'll get rewarded accordingly. I'm not going to go through all the details. They're in the manual, but they are the principles. Just remember that if you've got products with EPDs, you can get higher point scores. The other thing to bear in mind is if you've got a product that has an EPD certificate, it will have a certificate and it will have a green guide rating on it with that particular material assessed in a certain specification. Now, unless that specification matches exactly what is the one that you've got in your building, you can't use it. What do you do? Well, you have to do a bespoke green guide query. Okay? So you'll find out what the actual green guide equivalent rating would be with that material in the specification that you've got. You can't just use the one on the certificate because it probably isn't going to match the one you've got in your building. The, the, the importance of reporting key information, this particular one is required. We need to find and report life cycle greenhouse gas emissions via the reporting tool. Okay? It's all on the online green guide and if you're doing an EPD, it's on the certificate in the appendix. So that information will again give us valuable information for the future. On to MAT3 now. So the only thing that's changed here, nothing's changed in the methodology. The only thing that's changed here are the, the tier um, numbers. So I need to explain this uh, quite carefully. You can see here we've now got, effectively we've got eight tiers. One all the way down to eight. Eight is non-compliant. Uh, one is actually vacant. So we've left a space for the development of these schemes. Okay, and you can see the allocation of the, some of the tiers there in terms of some of the environmental management systems, the BRE, BES 6001. Um, the excellent value of BES 6001 is getting a tier two. The old tier one stuff has generally been allocated tier three. Okay, now just to emphasize, if you're a timber certifier and you think, well, that's not fair, it's just as easy to get credits with Tier 3 as it was originally for Tier 1. Nothing's changed in there. It's just even easier to get it if you've got even higher than that. Okay? So there's an opportunity to, it, at the same time, not penalising the current systems to encourage those systems to have a space to improve. So in terms of calibration, nothing has changed. Okay, so excellent has been promoted slightly, but... Uh, that's the only thing that's changed there. Everything else is assessed exactly as you're, you're currently used to. So you can see the timber tiers there are defined. Okay, so two will obviously be adjusted and it will work in the same way. On to waste, nothing changed there, so flick through that. Land use and ecology, again, hardly anything changed here. The only thing that has slightly changed is the mitigating ecological impact. And to explain, obviously that's looking at the before and after rating that you're all familiar with. And we use this word taxon, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of that phrase, but it's an ecological term that defines the species richness, which is exactly what we've been measuring all these years, just haven't called it that. So, based on countryside survey data, and we've replaced the old way of defining plot types and landscape types with one broad habitat type. So you don't need to work out the landscape type and plot type, you still need to work out the general habitat type. Still need the areas, still a calculator, and the use of the qualified ecologist is valuable. So these are the broad habitat types. You may not be an ec ecological expert, I'm not. I'll have to read <laughs> what those mean, but that's not a problem because I've got definitions in the manual on what each one of those is. If it's still beyond me, then that's where the ecologist will come in and support that definition allocation. Okay, so just be aware that those, those have changed. The other thing that we, is an improvement is that we've got a way of measuring more accurately the award you can give to derelict land. So if you got originally something that was acid grassland, for example, if it was completely undeveloped, you would have that particular species richness. Clearly, 
if it's only been, it's been built on, it goes down to zero. And, but if it's been built on and then it's been left derelict, the first five years it's still zero, but after five, between five and ten years, there's a little bit of species value coming back. Eventually, after 30 years, you can say it's back to normal. Okay? So there's a, an increased reward possible there for derelict land. Okay, finally, on pollution, just a couple of areas to look at here. Pole 1, just the way we assess it, and I'll go through a little bit about Pole 3. So Pole 1 has improved because we're not just looking at the global warming potential anymore. We're looking at a lot of other variables that are going to make a big difference. So this new definition called direct effect life cycle CO2 equivalent emissions, bit of a mouthful, will take into account a lot more information. But that all comes from the manufacturer, so uh, you'll get that in the course of that process anyway. So not only looks at the global warming potential of that particular um, refrigerant, it looks at how much there is of it, the cooling capacity, so we're offsetting how effective it is. We're also looking at how likely it is to release or leak, because that's ultimately what we want to stop. So if it's, it could be very, very toxic, but it, doesn't, it never leaks and it can be contained if it does, then that will be taken into account. Okay? So it's much more improved and more accurate, but a little bit more information to gather to make that work. Okay, pole calculator, pole one calculator does all that and you get the information from the manufacturer. All right, uh, so finally, pole three, surface water. Anybody who's been to the code presentation or code assessor day will have seen this a uh, little bit already. It's pretty much replicated what is in the code. Okay, although it's not uh, mandatory like it is in the code in some respects. So I'm just going to cover the two credits available for surface water runoff. The other two you're familiar with already. Okay, just to clarify the role of the assessor here, um, unless you're an expert in this area, hydrologist, civil engineer in that respect, your role is to communicate the requirements, not demonstrate compliance. It's up to the design team and the experts to do that. So as long as you understand the basic principles that you need to put over and ensure that they're being followed and met, then you're doing everything you need to. Consultant will demonstrate compliance and provide the calculations. And what we're trying to do here is trying to facilitate a shift in thinking about things like we are across the whole of Bream, to think about things well in advance before we just have to resort to the worst case scenario. So there is a lot more sustainable solutions than some others. We want to try and encourage that. Here's a summary of the requirements. So there is a prerequisite, you've got to employ a consultant. The two credits, the first one is looking at the peak rate of runoff and the second credit is looking at the volume of runoff. But you also need to ensure that there's no flooding for a local system's drainage failure. Okay, that's the summary of what you need to do. Let's just cover the principles, what we're trying to achieve here. So let's say you've got a greenfield land here. There's going to be some rain, it will run off into the stream but a lot of it will infiltrate into the ground. Okay. The bit that runs off, that's the bit that we're concerned with. If it all disappears into the ground, we haven't got a problem. Okay? But when it runs off, it can cause problems. Of course, if we build a building, there's less infiltration possible. So the increase in runoff is going to happen, unless we do something about that. And that's what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to get it back to the level of runoff it was before the building was built, in a nutshell. So possible solutions, you could put a soak away in, accelerate the infiltration at that particular area, things like permeable paving, where the water can go that would have was falling on the roof, it's got somewhere else to go rather than running off. So hopefully those solutions will mean that the runoff is now back to what it was before the building was created. Another solution is to put in some rainwater harvesting, collect all the stuff that goes onto the roof, goes into the dwelling to be used. Obviously that's not adding to the runoff because you're already getting runoff from the taps and so on to the sewers. No additional runoff, again you've met the criteria. So very simple principles there to illustrate the intent. Now this is the bit where we need to really clarify what's 
possible. There are various approaches to solving all those kind of problems. They're all listed here, some of them are listed here. So you can deal with it at source, where the, the rain lands, you can deal with it on site, where it moves to, or you can deal with it outside of the site, more on a regional control level. Our assessments do not really cover the, it's not really our remit to do that final one, but we can provide solutions to the other areas. Now, in terms of the criteria, you need to appoint this consultant. They obviously need to be qualified and prepared to deliver what's required. They need to look at all the calculations and provide those, and specialists need to be appointed if that's needed. The peak runoff rate, this is the detail of the criteria, it must be no greater than it was for the pre-developed site. And in terms of the, the numbers, it's for the one-year event and the hundred-year event. So the average storm in a year, the average storm in a hundred years, it needs to be able to deal with. Okay? Drainage measures specified and calculations proving that it's working as best practice. Now, in terms of actually doing that, now the second credit is no flooding in the event of a lo local system drainage failure. Just go back to that previous slide. That's all looking at the, the rate of runoff. This is looking at the volume of runoff. Okay. Now, there are two options here. You have to do option one unless there is a good reason, provable reason, that you can't. Okay. So option one is that you need to prevent any additional volume being prevented from leaving the site. For the 100-year event, of a six hour length duration storm. Okay? So you can't have anything more than would normally go off for the bare site, the undeveloped site, going off the site for that particular scenario. And this is the important bit. What you can use to achieve that is defined as any sustainable drainage system technique, but does not include something that just simply holds back the water. I'll clarify that on the next slide but you can't use holding back solutions to achieve that first one. It's worth your while because it's a lot easier to achieve that in terms of the volume of water you need to deal with than it is for the second one. Okay? So that's an incentive to do it in that way. If there's a no way you can do that, then you provide that justification from the consultant and then you simply go down option two, which is the post-development runoff must be reduced to what's called the limiting discharge, which is a lot lower flow rate than would be required for this one, okay? But you've got every possible solution available to you for that. So you can stick a great big fat tank in if you want to, if that's worth it. Um, the limiting discharge is the greatest of the pre-development one-year peak flow rate, the mean annual flood flow rate, known as Q-bar, or two litres per second per hectare. So whichever of those three is the greatest, that's what you've got to get it down to, okay? and you can do any solution. So the ones in red are the ones you can't use in option one because they're simply just holding the water back. But in option two you can use them. Okay. So there's various other notes that come with that. Um, so if you've got sites with many buildings there's information in the manual about that. There's information about what the calculations need to comply with. So the assessor, again, is not doing that. Clearly, if you've got no change in impermeable area, then you get these credits by default because there's going to be no increase in flow off the site. The other thing to be aware of is that you shouldn't have a discharge at any one point less than five litres per second because it's probably going to block up. It's not a practical solution. So the consultants will know that, and you can confirm that's OK. And we've already talked about rainwater harvesting. There's a code of practice that needs to be complied with on, on that one. Okay. Just be aware, you probably already know this already, that there are different calculation methods for working out the peak rate of runoff for greenfield sites of different sizes and brownfield sites. So just be aware, it's all in the manual, but you need to refer to what you've got and find the correct calculation method. Okay. That's just about it for me, but just to summarise, some other stuff to look out for. In MAN 3, there are some slightly rede redefined criteria for construction site impacts. Indoor air qualities, additional credit criteria and reporting requirements. Um, thermal comfort, new criteria and reporting requirements for that. So 
TOR stands for time out of range. So if you're overheating for more than you should be in terms of a period of time, there's a, a requirement to correct that. There's updated benchmarks for waste one in construction site waste management. There is a new checklist in LE2, ecological value of site. So be aware that the old one is now gone. And I already talked about the exemplary level <coughs> requirements. So there is enhanced uh, credits available across all of those. <coughs>